Today's guest is David Kuhn, leader of the Green Party. We're in the early stages of a provincial election, which was unexpected. Up until this point in time, the four-way minority government had been doing a great job in managing the COVID-19 pandemic, also handling our entry back into schools, handling our economy, and several other things. It goes to show that after just 18 months, a minority government was starting to get its legs underneath itself and figure out how to work. But Premier Higgs decided it's time for an election. So here we are going through some key issues, talking about voting on vaccinations, and laying out some of the early stages of the party's platform and recruitment of candidates. So thanks, David. My pleasure. You busy? Well, it's it's always busy, but uh, particularly with a snap election, there's a lot of things that you can't plan for ahead of time um, that, um, you know, without knowing when the election actually is going to be. So yeah. as a party, we we uh, we grew up with fixed election dates. And so this is our first snap election. So it's interesting. Yeah. Um, on that spirit of snap election, and I couldn't help but notice on Monday was this rap ad by the conservatives. Yes. And uh, just so people can remember, you know, so to book one of these things takes about two weeks to get your artwork done, approval of our artwork and all that. And there you were, the four leaders, trying to work out some sort of a longer term cooperative deal. Um, a lot of the public and social media will be talking about, well, this was set up the whole time anyway, which gets to the seriousness or the sincerity of the intent of trying to figure out a longer term cooperative arrangement. You want to speak to that a bit, how somebody kind of had an advantage knowing that everything was lined up and the bus was already decorated. And, and then you guys are thinking, well, we spent four days, five days grinding her out to try to figure out something. <laughs> yeah. And then goes boom like that. And now everybody's running. And Yeah, well, you know, I knew that the party machine uh, wanted the election. And uh, that is the conservative party machine. And I knew that... Um, that uh, a lot of a lot of uh, Blaine Higgs's MLAs wanted to go to an election. Uh, they wanted to seize the moment to try and get a majority government so that they wouldn't have to worry about talking to us, for example, when it comes to uh, getting bills passed um, or or worry what they put in their throne speech or budget because they need, you know, maybe our support to get it passed. And that's important because if you look at this most recent budget, there are clearly things in there uh, that we had been advocating for and that I've been advocating for for a long time that were put in the budget. For example, to um, tie income assistance to the rate of inflation so that when inflation increases, income assistance goes up uh, rather than being eaten away, which has happened over the last decade, as well as a small increase uh, in current rates, not enough, but... Um, so, you know, or we've been, I've been talking a lot about um, um, the fact that students should not be paying interest on student loans. And uh, so the budget reduced interest on student loans. Um, so there, there are a number of examples. You can see that because it was a minority government and because of the particular things uh, as green MLAs and as a leader we were pushing, uh, they showed up in the budget. Um, and that's the great thing about minority governments. You got a diversity of voice, voices that find their way into the budgets and throne speeches. Um, so the the whole exercise um, last week was that last week? Yeah, last week yep. was to uh, to I guess from Blaine Hinks' perspective, try and formalize something across four part four parties, which was a Herculean. Um, Mm -hmm. effort in terms of or, 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 or initiative the chances of something like that succeeding are not very high um, but uh, this I think this was personal for him and he he basically stood alone in his party um, on not really wanting to see an election uh, and I believe he was sincere about that but he also <laughs> he also didn't understand what was going to be involved in coming to some kind of agreement among four parties. And he set a, an overly ambitious agenda, that's for sure. Mm. Um, but at the same time, you know, I don't think that the liberals were there in good faith. Um, that was my, my impression. 
Um, that's not to beat up on them. I just, yep. that was my impression. Um, they can speak for themselves. But anyway, that's, uh, you know, and, and I went in totally skeptical because, you know, I was made no bones about it in the media beforehand. Uh, I, I said uh, it was overreach what he was trying to do and so on. But once we sat down and started uh, discussing brass tacks and uh, I saw that he was sincere about seeing if something could be worked out, I thought, okay, well, let's let's roll up our sleeves and see what you can come up with. Um, so that's how the myself and my two uh, Green MLA colleagues uh, participated. And, yeah. Interesting that we've gone through one of the toughest times ever with dealing with the COVID pandemic, and it was with the minority government that New right. Brunswick did so well. Media kept portraying it as the Higgs government, but the reality was it was the four-way discussion yeah. going on and leadership from those people who should be untouchable through party politics or health care and education and such. <clears throat> now we're going into an election. Is there some way that we can pick up that thread, that cooperative, complementary politics, so that the voters have a confidence this time that they can vote a four-way split and it got us, through, got us through a tough time? So it can take us through the rest of it? If the outcome is another <clears throat> minority government, it's going to be essential to pick up that thread and figure out how to uh, work even better collaboratively. I mean, I, we were only, as, as, as parliamentarians, we were only getting our feet under us with a minority government and legislature uh, in the last six months, I would say, out of, out of 18. Um, and things were starting to kind of w work in that way. Um, and so if there's another minority government, that's, I mean, for it to function, that's what has to happen by definition. If it's a, major a majority government, I don't think we're going to see that. Yep. And we go back to the way we've done things the past 40 years. Yeah, we will. And then that gets into people who aren't elected having more influence on the government than the people who are elected. Because one of the dynamics that happens with the minority government is it puts more authority and influence in the legislature and committees. It does put more influence in the legislature and in committees, and it helps governments, if they choose, to use that to to um, rebuff some of the uh, pressure from outside high-paid lobbyists, if they choose. Because they can say, well, normally, <laughs> maybe, but, you know, I've got all this complication in the legislative assembly and it's not so straightforward yep. uh so i think the the results for new brunswickers have been good um and i said to the premier you know the government functioned as a minority government pretty well in these first two years uh and he kept talking about it becoming dysfunctional and i said well i don't see why you're saying that um no one seemed unhappy with the way things were working. You know, I was even able to support your budget, um, your second budget, not your first budget. I couldn't support it, but your second budget I supported because it contained um, some really important measures that were going to make diff the difference uh, in people's lives directly, substantially in New Brunswick. Um, and, uh, and there was nothing in there that I felt was going to be destructive to people's um, well-being. Mm -hmm. So, so unlike the first budget, so, so I supported it, and uh, and that uh, opened the opened the door to ensuring that um, the budget got through, and we didn't have a government fall in the middle of the COVID. Yep. So last time we were at the front end of an election, uh, pollsters and media pundits didn't even really have Green Party or People's Alliance on their radar. Um, it never showed up in their stats. Never showed up in their commentaries. And much to their surprise on election night, <laughs> it goes the way it did. So that's a new history for us. And like you mentioned, there was only, a, you were just getting your legs underneath you as a, a cooperative unit, to put it in a phrase. Has enough time gone by and are enough people aware that um, no longer be afraid of minority governments now that that's been established? Oh, I think so. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I know there's... Lots of people who just don't want to see a majority government because they know that when you have a majority government uh, today, it really results in um, uh, um, decisions that are made that are not reflective necessarily of 
um, the will of the people is expressed through the diversity of voices that are engaged in the minority government situation. What are the key points that you want people to catch uh, as we get the show up and running and it gets its audience in the second and third week of the election as you work to the fourth week? What are the <clears throat> building blocks for this quick election and um, what you want people to understand most about Green Party? Well, as you know, I've said we've got to build a, a, a climate of, uh, of uh, respect in this province. Uh, across regions and among peoples. Um, we've had the People's Alliance uh, legislature that have um, been divisive. And, uh, and um, the, the fact that the Premier um, uh, is unable to speak French at all is a problematic uh, for the Francophone population. And it particularly was acute um, you know, during the briefings when there was so much fear at the beginning of COVID. Um, and it would have been fine if he had asked one of his two MLAs who are bilingual to join him to be a spokesperson in French, and, and that didn't happen. Uh, so so there, the divisions have reemerged um, in, a, in a worrisome way. Um, between uh, our two linguistic communities, Francophone and Anglophone. Um, so that's a concern. And so, yes, we need to build a climate of respect. And, uh, and we really need to focus on creating an economy of care um, because we've moved away from that. I mean, I've said repeatedly, we, 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 we've got to end this singular obsession with governments saying, well, the, the, the magic solution is to grow the economy and that will solve all of our ills. Well, if that's all you're doing, of course it's not going to sol all, solve all of our ills. Uh, we've got to think about the broader um, piece of, of, uh, of safeguarding people's well-being and enhancing it, um, which has financial and economic pieces like that. Do people have some disposable income? You know, uh, can they afford to meet their basic necessities? Uh, are they able to work in something meaningful that um, that um, they feel like they're you know contributing to to society, and so on? Um, so so the well-being uh, of families and individuals, the communities to which they belong, and and of course the environment that that sustains us all, to me is the central piece that needs to be at the heart of government decision making, um, and uh, and of course a piece of that is a, is a, a healthy economy. But if the well if if well being overall is the framework, you look at that, then then your economy will develop in ways that is not going to be harmful but helpful and positive. And right now that's not what happens uh, often. Uh, so we get we get growth that is actually uneconomic because the content of the growth doesn't matter. You know, and we get growth that uh, damages and undermines communities and people's lives that, that degrades the environment or contributes to climate change. We don't need that kind of growth. That's damaging growth on economic growth. So, so if we, if, if we use well being as the overall lens, then you can see where the economy nicely fits in there in a way that actually matters to people. Um, in terms of their income, are they able to save money? You know, do they have extra money to to uh, take a, a trip or be on a, go on a vacation? Some disposable income. <coughs> Excuse me. So, so um, th that that's a whole different way of looking at this, and uh, that's that's our approach. And then in terms of how to, how the government needs to manage, we we I say we need to put the money, spend the money where it matters, right? And uh, Mr. Higgs is, is quite um, parsimonious. You know, he's reluctant to spend money on anything, really. And uh, that's no way to govern. Uh, you want to spend money where it matters the most to people, again, with that idea of, of sustaining and improving people's well-being, mm -hmm. um, rather than spending on things <clears throat> that are, might undermine it or, or not help at all. So... Uh, that's, I think, the, the third piece uh, around that. So 
you know, a climate of respect, an economy of care, and uh, and and uh, spending the money where it's actually going to matter for people. Well, not long ago, and following that theme, Herb Emery, uh, economics prof up at UNB, did this whole piece about why does New Brunswick keep driving prosperity away, and the way he defined prosperity in that piece was about investment. And he identified some $40 billion in investment that had been chased out of the province. And at the end of the piece, he, he really kind of tattooed who he thought was responsible for that, the, the naysayers and stuff. It was interesting because um, there's other ways of building an economy, like you just spoke to, not necessarily pipelines and oil and fracking gas and those things. About the same time that came out, RPC, Research Productivity Council, came out with a map of all the opportunities for New Brunswick to develop mining around the province. And uh, if you ever there was going to, not a conflict point, but it's going to be hot about what do we need to do for the well-being of the province and can we change the narrative around what is an economy? Is it an industrial economy or are we on the cusp of a change for a new one? So sounds like part of what your work is is to try to nudge that discussion in a different direction towards wellness. And the other pieces fit in. So do you have some concrete examples? Because this is where people get picky on the details. So do you have a concrete example of how we can shift from this over to this? And there's still um, there's still a distribution of wealth and there's still an employment rate. And well, I don't think it's going to be kind of a shift from one side to the other. I think it's, it's um, uh, broadening our economy in a way that it's not singularly dependent on, on uh, exports. Um, which has been the obsession of success of governments to the extension exclusion of, of, of the other parts of the economy, particularly our local economies in New Brunswick. So we could become far more self-sufficient in a number of things, um, which would keep the money circulating in New Brunswick rather, rather than it leaking out across our borders. Um, and that would strengthen our economy and make it much more resilient. Uh, to what happens with export markets as we're seeing. So two, two obvious right off the bat examples are uh, feeding ourselves to the degree we can um, and, uh, and, and, and powering our, our lives to the degree that we can. Um, so uh, everyone wants to have a solar panel on the roof. Where's the program to help that happen? Every, just about every mayor I've talked to in each corner of the province wants to have a community wind farm, um, primarily because electricity is less costly than what they can buy from NB Power. Today, that's the reality. Yeah. No, sorry, but will NB Power dig in then, saying we're the utility responsible for providing power and we don't want anybody chipping away? Well, they have dug in on that exactly. But I'm just saying, so, so the ability for us to uh, feed ourselves significantly more than we do now uh, to to um, power our, our society more than we do now is significant. Um, and uh, those things in, a, in and of themselves would um, grow the economy. And then you start to look at, okay, what, what, other, uh, what other imports uh, that we're dependent on could we, could we diminish and, by ramping up production in New Brunswick? And so... Um, that's a whole other lens, um, not to the exclusion of exports in any way. We'll, we've always been an exporting province, and we, as far as I can see, always will be. You know, we're, we're a lumber producer, and, and we produce uh, a lot of potatoes and, and lobster and so on. So, so we will continue to have an export, an export uh, component to our economy. But we need to build uh, our domestic economy at the same time. And that's uh, been given short shrift. Nova Scotia's done a much better job of that. And you can see that uh, they actually are more self-sufficient uh, when you run the numbers than New Brunswick is uh, in terms of, of what they produce for use in Nova Scotia. That doesn't mean they're not also exporting, uh, but they are more self-sufficient that way than we are. And, and that means, m so the bottom line of that is more of the money, more of the wealth created in the province uh, stays in the province and stays within communities uh, so that you've got real community wealth rather than it, it uh, pouring out of the province um, thanks to minimum wage workers, you know, creating 
um, uh, products that are going to be sold outside of New Brunswick. Anyway, yeah. that's that's the kind of philosophy. Okay, good. Um, always during an election, a dominant uh, topic of conversation will be health care, the cost of health care, it's the largest part of the budget, etc. Right. Um, it's fascinating to watch over all the decades now that the conversation is always the same. And um, I'm wondering if this might be the window where there's a political opportunity because of the four-way minority in the past, recent past, to shift that conversation a little bit to the preventative side, because tied to improving our ability to feed ourselves and provide and shifting a community having more autonomy over itself, which could get into municipal reform a little bit. Um, but if you want to reduce health care costs within 20 years, then the shortest way to do that is to have a healthier population, sure. which means they're accessing. But most of our policies are still geared kind of the other way of um, maintaining the system as it is and trying to tweak within it and improve it. Do you have any thoughts about um, in this election if there's a chance to push that as a, a policy in reducing health care costs? Well, I think um, that... that in this election, I'm not sure, but I, I, I felt like there was an opportunity in the minority government to move forward in that area. Um, so, so it does require um, restructuring the way government is operating around health care and the determinants of health. Um, because, for example, poverty is a, a huge determinant of health. And unless you tackle poverty in a fundamental way, um, that's going to continue, continue to make wreak havoc on people's lives uh, because of ill health and drive health costs. Uh, so those things nicely are linked, right? So do we have a serious, uh, is there a serious program or plan to lift people out of poverty? Absolutely not. Um, so that would be, you know, in terms of, it's not exactly preventative health care, but it, it, it's an important piece. So there's the two parts. We need to tackle the, the, uh, the social determinants of health and try and, and, and address them to, to reduce, uh, to improve people's lives and, and uh, reduce the impacts on, on health care budgets. And then, yes, uh, how do we, uh, what we, do we need to put in place to help uh, ensure people are generally healthier in the province? Um, it does require reorganizing the system because we have the Department of Health which kind of monitors what's going on um, and we have the two health authorities that um, run essentially the hospitals and then we have our nurse practitioners and doctors who provide primary health care and their allied the allied health professionals around them so uh, to get at that uh, you've got to kind of reorganize the system, um, and that's a, a big deal, uh, which I, we need to do. Um, so, so it's not something that I think easily happens in in the context of a, an election debate, hmm. um, but uh, it needs to happen. So, so for example, um, food. Um, my colleague Kevin Arsenault proposed that the Department of Agriculture uh, be given responsibility for food. No one has responsibility for food. Food is such an essential part of our health. Where is anyone doing the work to um, help promote healthy eating or helping people understand what that means? Um, and then coming up where there are barriers to that, putting in place policies or legislation or or programs to overcome those barriers, right? So you, you need you need someone with that th with that turf. Yeah. You're responsible for food in New Brunswick and the various dimensions of it, including ensuring people are um, supporting people to have healthy diets. Yeah. Uh, go, yeah. you know. So there's no one with that job. Yeah, there w there was at one point in time wellness branch. Yes, that's right. Had, had elements of it, it in did. there. It did. And then wellness branch got folded. That's a good point. Well, well wellness had, it was part of a department which was kind of dedicated in that direction, a small department. Yeah. Uh, but instead of growing, it was it was uh, turned into a branch in another department and then eliminated altogether. Yeah. So this is the political problem with wellness is that parties don't see any um, political benefit to it because it's, the impacts are longer term. Mm -hmm. And there also is some ideological perspective that, well, 
um, that's just up, that's up to individuals and, and uh, too bad if they, you know, uh, aren't eating well. So, um, there's a political divide, an ideological divide in there as well. Yeah. 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 Um, back to election work. Um, how goes the recruitment of candidates? Um, snap election, you, you gotta, gotta find the people. Um, it's gotta be different than the first time you ran. It gotta be different from last time. Um, and in, yeah. in the team, because you have momentum, um, you definitely have recognition. Yeah. Um, and there's a whole platform, uh, you know, mainstream media still boxes you as green, therefore environmental, um, rather than if you just read the darn platform <laughs> the last two times, you'll see all the different elements to it. Right. It's very comprehensive. So, Does that help attract candidates? So, uh, so candidate recruitment has been going very well. We have a, an incredible slate of candidates, uh, more than 50% women. Um, at this point, we've still got, I think, seven ridings to finish up with a, um, getting a candidate through there. But at this point, more than 50% women, um, uh, diversity in, 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 the, in the slate as well. So I'm very happy. Um, small business people like Luke Randall and the Fredericton North here. Um, uh, we've got a couple of lawyers like uh, uh, Carol Chan in Moncton South. Um, we run the gamut. And uh, now, which is uh, great, and so um, I'm very excited by uh, by the quality of our candidates and uh, how engaged they are in their communities, which is what's really important uh, and have been, you know. Mm. So uh, I'm looking forward to uh, the results of this election returning uh, considerably more Greens to the Legislative Assembly than than the three we've had this last two years. Mm. That'd be interesting for you, wouldn't it? To have a few more, because there was a small adjustment from being alone and all this committee work that doesn't well, get much media. It was and a there's big just, adjustment from just being David, alone. David, and then there's, there's yeah. three of you. Yeah, that's right. It was a big adjustment from being alone, and, and uh, for sure. So, and it, you know, it helps you look at what you're doing and, and uh, lots of discussion on, on, uh, on, on bills and um, so on. Uh, you know, like, the, like uh, the education minister's bill, when the conservatives brought in the bill, to um, uh, change the exemptions on mandatory vaccinations. So for nine months um, from that bill being presented, I assumed it was a no-brainer. I was going to vote for it. Every, every student who is able to should be vaccinized, vaccinated unless there's health problems. Yep. Um, but as Greens, we actually take our job seriously about digging down into bills and seeing if they need to be improved or if there are flaws in them or not adequate. And, uh, you know, nine months later, I was, I was uh, working at, at the committee stage where you do that, you dig into the bill, and it turned out, uh, it turned out that our vaccination rates are good, um, that uh, very few people, our parents, are actually using these exemptions. Um, so we've got safe levels of vaccinations, very few people are actually using the exemptions. Um, yes, uh, government should have the ability to eliminate the exemptions if, if our vaccination levels are threatened in any way. Um, but uh, that's not the case right now. So I tried to make a, 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 an amendment to it, which said, uh, yes, government should have the ability to uh, eliminate these exemptions when necessary. It's not necessary right now. Otherwise, the chief medical officer of health will be out there, uh, you know, storming the ramparts, demanding that uh, the exemptions be gone today. But she wasn't. In fact, the committee, she said it's not needed right now. Our chief medical officer of health. So I'm going, I'm thinking, OK, um, then why don't we provide that power to get rid of the exemptions when necessary? Because uh, the, the impact of that is having a few children being barred from uh, their right to a public education. So if it's not necessary right now, why impose that on those children? Mm -hmm. And is this the backstory to abstaining? So that's it. So, so uh, when my exemption failed, I mean my exemption, when my amendment <laughs> failed, yeah. uh, the, the minister refused to accept it. Um, and I said, well, clearly the evidence you provided says the, 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 the need to uh, change those exemptions uh, now is, is not there. And maybe, I agree, maybe it will be necessary in the future. So let's just 
modify the bill to provide that authority to do so when necessary. Um, and that way, kids aren't going to be unnecessarily thrown out of school. But he refused. So uh, what was I going to do? I had started out for nine months um, planning on voting for the bill because I support vaccinations and I thought it's a no-brainer. Every child should be vaccinated in our school system. Our mandatory vaccination laws have been in place for 38 years. They've served us so well. Um, and so uh, when it failed, I thought, well, I'm not going to vote against it because I'm not against the principle of this bill. But I can't vote for it because it's, it's got this flaw in it. Yeah. The flaw being that uh, the, the, the authority to eliminate the exemptions is, uh, is good, but uh, the action, the implementation of that is not necessary at the moment because our vaccination rates are, are good, they're safe. Uh, so let's just say, make that change say when it's necessary. Well, uh, so given that, I, the, the, the option really was to say, well, I will vote for it even though it's not necessary at the moment, but there's going to be some kids thrown out of school. So I said, well, okay, we talked about it uh, among us, and well, the sensible thing, the sensible thing, it seems, would be uh, to abstain then and explain why. Um, what seems sensible to us, uh, working the legislature uh, on a bill that had a flaw in it, um, turned out to be, you know, problematic for a lot of people. A lot of people were surprised and concerned about that, um, and would have assumed I would, would have assumed what I'd assumed I was going to do for months and months until I really dug into the bill, and that was vote for it. Yep. Yep. So, um, so that's and but. But what I learned was exemption with an explanation uh, it doesn't really work well in terms of uh, people um, being able to, to understand that. Because, because when, I, uh, when people stop me on the street and ask me about it and I explain briefly they, they, to a person, they say, well, oh, I'm relieved. I understand what, why you did what you did. Um, but without having the chance to do that with every person, it's a problem because because people interpret it as all kinds of ways. You know, while well, you cave to the people who are opposed to vaccinations, you know, what about the science? Well, the ironic thing was it was about the science. You know, we 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 need to maintain our vaccination rates at a safe level. Um, there's no vaccination program in the world that has a hundred percent of the people vaccinated and no one's ever tried to achieve that because mm. uh, from a from the science tells us we need depending on the disease and the vaccination 80 percent or 85 percent or 90 percent or whatever it might be according to the science of the people vaccinated to to uh to uh, provide the protection that that immunization does mm. and uh so that's the science of it. And so if we've got safe levels of vaccination, then there's no sense of urgency to uh, change the exemptions given the consequences for a relatively few number of students. But still, um, if there's no reason now for them to be denied an education, why would you do it until, until there actually is a reason? Uh, two quick thoughts and then we wrap up. Um, a quick response on um, no municipal elections. So we're having a provincial election. The municipal one got cancelled. Uh, understandably so, because we're in the middle of the COVID stuff. We know more now four months later. But there hasn't been a peep about um, going back to municipal elections. And lastly, um, close us out with uh, your message for the audience for voting green in this election. I've heard a lot from people in, in town about <laughs> where's the municipal elections. Um, and a lot of people are furious over this provincial election, as they should be, because it's unnecessary. There's absolutely no rationale for it whatsoever, other than um, for the, the conservatives to try and uh, achieve a majority government uh, for their own purposes. Um, so the, 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 the easy answer is elections in Brunswick only has so much capacity, and it takes four months to set up a municipal election. Um, so that's what they were planning for to set it up for next May. And so, um, you know, they would have plenty of time to do that. Meanwhile, 
they've been just like uh, all of us uh, who are MLA has been on the kind of teetering on the edge of an election since uh, since the winter when it looked like maybe uh, with the budget the government might be brought down in, back in March. Uh, so so elections in Brunswick really had to be prepared pre prepared for a snap uh, provincial election, and in doing so they couldn't they couldn't stand up a municipal election. It was just just the yep. the Great. reality for them. Um, and it's too bad because there's lots of mayors and councillors who are planning on, weren't planning on reoffering and we're looking forward to doing other things and so on. But here we are. Yep. Good. One, the one thing I always say about the pandemic and COVID-19 is the only certain thing is uncertainty. Yeah. Yep. Which in a way is a huge opportunity for new narratives and new approaches. So message to voters. Well, uh, certainly. I think people have seen uh, how we have worked, um, how serious we take our jobs, how connected we are to our communities, uh, how hard we work, and uh, that we um, raise issues that are important to uh, regular people. Um, we're not the party of big money, and we're not the party of, uh, of uh, um, um, ideology that uh, supports supports uh, those with the most power in society. Um, so, you know, we have a slate of candidates that is unparalleled now. Um, so I think that I'm asking people to look at their candidates, uh, look at the green candidates in their writings, um, find out more about them, and, uh, and certainly, you know, look at our platform. And uh, I believe that... Uh, We'll see considerable uh, support for uh, many more green MLAs across the province, and uh, and we will be uh, not three, but uh, maybe three times three or more. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for watching. Be good. Have fun. Love each other. It all starts with the story, and if we have a place where we can share our stories, then we have a sense of how to build community. The Dennis Report's theme is Everything's Connected. If we nurture that connection, New Brunswick can do amazing things. But first, it starts with listening and sharing our stories. The Dennis Report.ca, Patreon, or PayPal. Thanks.